shame. An emotionally driven outcome of our own sense of failure. As having been unable to conform to a physical, mental or moral standard, mostly of our own making, we re-evaluate ourselves in a very negative way and are left feeling guilty, distressed, powerless and worthless. Shame can be a powerful motivator. It can guide us to greatness, wealth, power and success. As the raw emotion we originally felt returns, causing our hearts to pump, muscles to tense and nerves to tingle even decades later. But the outcome entirely depends on the person, as even what seems like a meaningless moment of shame can trigger a personal crisis which can shape us for the worst. On Friday the 20th of March 1953, Rich Christie left his ground floor flat at 10 Rillington Place, never to return. During a decade-long reign of terror, seven women, one man and a baby had died. But their killer had never been caught, and with most of the victims having gone unreported, nobody knew that one of Britain's most prolific serial killers lived in Ladbrook Grove. And now, he had disappeared. Some of what follows is based on the killer's own memories and perspective, so what part of this story is true is up to you. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, this is Murder Mile, and I present to you part 10 of the full, true and untold story of the other side of 10 Rillington Place. Today, I'm standing on the T-junction of King's Cross Road and Calthorpe Street, WC1, one mile south of the Regent's Canal, where the body of Sebastiano Magnanini was dumped. Parts of Paula Fields were found, and the mortuary where Glyndor Michael was reborn as a war hero. To my right is the Mount Pleasant sorting office. And that's it. There's a flat, a shop, a pub, but no people. No one comes here. It's dead. Even the postal sorting depot is being demolished as they turn it into, yes, you've already guessed it, posh flats for overpaid tosspots. Who won't stay here, but are willing to fork out four grand a month so they've got somewhere to dump their dirty pants, hide their hummus, quaff quinoa, shag their secretary, and all as a tax write-off. How romantic. Anticipating this rejuvenation, at number one Calthorpe Street, they've built the Crown Plaza. A four-star hotel with restaurants, a gym, a spa, and a swimming pool. Ooh. With tourists on the inside and homeless on the outside, the only people in this area are either hobos or hoity-toity, Vagrants or Volvo owners, tramps or fans of Taro Masalata, or drifters and dullards who only live for the latest dross on Netflix. Ooh. Before its demolition, on this site stood Roten House. Built in 1892, Roten House was one of five lodging houses in London, built by Lord Roten, which provided a bed, warmth and food for London's low-paid workers and it's down and out. Being six stories high in a stark Victorian style with bright red bricks and sharp turrets, it looked more like an asylum than a hostel. But with 678 beds at a cost of just one shilling a night, for many men, it beats sleeping on the streets. And yet, it was here that a bald, bespectacled little man, in a brown trilby hat and a fawn raincoat, would spend his final days of freedom. Born on the 8th of April, 1899, in Blackboy House in Ackroydon near Halifax, John Reginald Halliday Christie, nicknamed Reggie, was the second youngest of seven children. With one older brother, four older sisters and one younger sister, all born to Mary Hannah Halliday, a loving housewife and an overprotective mother. An earnest John Christie, 
a working class carpenter with a haughty demeanor, an explosive temper, and a burning desire for respectability. Therefore, it's ironic that as much as Reg claimed to despise his father, he would spend most of his life trying to emulate him. And when shamed by his own sense of failure, Reg would lie. As an officious man with a senior role in the Methodist Church, the Conservative Association, and later the Town Council, as the only person in the factory trained in first aid, Ernest was nicknamed Dr. Christie, a name he loved, as it alluded to him being a man of higher status in a middle-class profession. But to his son, Reg knew he had a lot to live up to. Unlike Ernest, Reg was small, skinny and slight. A shy boy with pale ginger hair and a limp handshake. And even being adored by his mother and protected by his sisters, he would become quiet, withdrawn and suppress his anger. As being beaten for even the smallest of reasons, he hid in his father's shadow and lived in fear of his wrath. In fact, the only time that they spoke was while gardening, a hobby they both loved, giving Reg a rare moment of peace with his father, which he would cherish. In 1910, aged 11, as a good student who never got into trouble, kept to himself and excelled at maths, Reg won a scholarship to Halifax Secondary School. Being bright but timid, just like his father, Reg threw himself into extracurricular activities, like singing in the All Souls Church Choir and rising to the lofty position of King Scout, an assistant scout leader in the church's troop. And yet, for all of his hard work, his mother lavished him with love, but praise never came from his father. As a hobby, it may have seemed innocent enough, having achieved a high status position in the Scouts. But more importantly, it instilled in Reg the importance of rank, uniform and status in winning over the trust and confidence of others. And this knowledge would shape the rest of his life. If the statements of Reg Christie are to be believed, there were three key moments in his upbringing which led him on the path to becoming a rapist, a serial killer and a necrophile. First, in 1911, as part of a Victorian Methodist custom, the body of his maternal grandfather, David Halliday, was laid out for the family to view prior to burial. Having been petrified of this stern-faced bully, Reg realised that this motionless corpse could no longer hurt him. And from that point onwards, Reg became fascinated by death. Secondly, raised in an almost exclusively female household, during a sexually repressive era where nudity was taboo, during his childhood, he claimed he caught a brief glimpse of his sister's stocking top. And this brief thrill brought about within him strange feelings. And thirdly, as a sexually inexperienced 16-year-old virgin, Reg and two friends went to an infamous lover's lane in Savile Park, known as the Monkey Run. Having paired off with a young lady, who he would later describe as a mill girl of loose morals, although his chums easily copulated, Reg stood there, trembling and ashamed, his limp penis in his hand, as the girl mercilessly mocked him. As did his friends, as did anyone who knew him, as, at least in his eyes, across his hometown, his failure was marked with a chorus of kids chanting, Reggie Nocock, and can't get it up Christie. Reg wouldn't lose his virginity for at least another year, and for the rest of his life, he would fear sexual failure hate morally loose women 
and bottled up inside him would remain this shame. As a teenager, Reg seemed like an upstanding boy who graduated with a school certificate, worked as a projectionist at Green's Picture Hall, and also worked as a warehouse boy at a bootmaker's called John Foster and Sons. But inside, being raised as a repressed Methodist, Reg was a mess of deep moral conflict. On the 19th of September 1916, age 17, two years into the First World War, Reg enlisted in the 52nd Nottingham and Derbyshire Signal Corps and was posted to the Redmires camp in Sheffield. With a rank, a role and a uniform, the army should have been his making. But he was never promoted and yet claimed he had turned it down three times. He never excelled and yet he claimed he had won many marksmanship competitions. And during his 16 months of service, he was charged twice for going absent without leave, having snuck off base to visit prostitutes. Women of loose morals, who he claimed to despise, and yet, in his eyes, they were the only women who wouldn't mock him, having been paid to be submissive to his needs. Having been mobilised one year earlier, on the 1st of April 1918, the 52nd Signal Corps was posted to Flanders on the Belgian front line, barely a quarter of a mile from the German troops, who were dug deep in their trenches. After four years of brutal conflict, the lush fields were a mess of muddy bogs, bum craters, and jagged reels of barbed wire, on which hung the festering corpses of fallen comrades. As shells burst eardrums, Bullets blew faces apart, boots sloshed in a sea of blood, and the acrid air was thick with the stench of decomposing bodies. In total, Reg saw active duty for just 11 weeks, but in that short traumatic period, he saw enough death to last a lifetime. Or so you would think. On the 28th of June 1918, Private Christie was injured when a mustard gas shell exploded near him. Having knocked him unconscious, plumes of the lethal chemical weapon swirled about him, choking him to death, as if, lying there, helpless and vulnerable, an overpowering force had gripped his throat. Having miraculously survived, when Reg awoke, the gas would render him blind for five months, mute for three and a half years, and although hospitalized for 32 days, his voice was never the same. For his injuries, Private Christie was granted a weekly disability allowance of eight shillings, and for his bravery, he was awarded the British War and Victory Medal. At least, that was the story that he told. In truth, his medical notes confirm he had no blisters on his skin, lungs or throat. He was never treated for an eye injury, and that, having been diagnosed with functional aphonia, an injury caused not by gas inhalation, but by fright, there was no known medical reason why his voice remained as a soft whisper. And yet, his injury proved invaluable to elicit sympathy from women and to aid his story as an injured war hero. On the 22nd of October 1919, Private John Christie was demobilized from the army. That day, he lost his role, his rank, his uniform and his wage. And with no skills, a small disability allowance and an insatiable thirst for sex workers, Reg started work at Sutcliffe's Woolen Mill in Halifax began dating Ethel Simpson, and on the 10th of May 1920, in Halifax Registry Office, she became Mrs. Ethel Christie. During those first few years of married life, Reg was shamed by three incidents, all of his own undoing. First, 
only able to become aroused by sexually submissive prostitutes, he failed to get Ethel pregnant. Second, being regularly unemployed and convicted twice for theft, he failed to provide as a husband. And third, having failed to live up to his father's high morals, he was disowned by his family. Feeling deeply ashamed, Reg left his hometown of Halifax, moved to London and abandoned Ethel for nine years. But his new life in the big city would start badly and would descend deeper into despair and debauchery. In 1924, just one year later, while cycling in the West End, Reg was hit by a taxi, knocked unconscious, and suffered minor injuries to his right shoulder, left knee, and head. That same year, being unemployed, homeless, broke, and hopelessly addicted to sex, Reg was found guilty of two counts of theft, having stolen a bicycle, money, and cigarettes and was sentenced to a further nine months hard labor. For the next eight years, he tried to go straight, but being unskilled, he drifted between jobs until once again, he was sent back to prison. But this time, his personality had taken a darker turn. On the 1st of May, 1929, after six months of cohabiting with Maud Cole in her ground floor flat at number six Almeric Road in Battersea, South London, being fed up with Reg leeching off her, Maud asked him to leave as she and her son sat eating a meal of fish and chips at the kitchen table. Silently, Reg got up as if to leave. But having swiped her son's cricket bat, he smacked her hard across the back of the head Everything went black, blood poured from the gaping wound, and Christy forced his fingers into her throat as she screamed, Don't let him get me! He's trying to murder me! Maud survived the attack, needing only five stitches. Two weeks later, Reg was tried at Southwestern Magistrates Court, and having claimed that this vicious and unprovoked assault was an accident, the magistrate branded him a liar and a coward and Reg Christie was sentenced to six months hard labor in Wandsworth Prison. In November 1933, a priest convinced Christie to break his self-destructive cycle and to turn over a new leaf. Convinced that the only good thing in his life was his wife, Reg asked Ethel to take him back, and with her affair to Vaughan Brindley over, and faced with the shame of divorce, they gave their marriage one last go. And so, in December 1938, the Christies moved into the ground floor flat at 10 Rillington Place. From 1943 to 1953, nine people would die. A death toll which in any other era would raise an eyebrow but having occurred during the London Blitz and the post-war chaos. As he preyed on the homeless, the penniless, the sick, the poor and the pregnant, for a whole decade, a serial killer walked the streets of London, murdering with impunity. And although on the outside he exuded the arrogance of a man who was getting away with murder, on the inside, Having been raised as morally decent, his ailing body was riddled with shame. Between 1937 and 1952, Reg Christie made 174 visits to the surgery of Dr. Matthew Odess in Colville Square, being plagued with fibrositis, diarrhea, headaches and piles. And although as a hypochondriac, who craved sympathy through exaggerated and imaginary illnesses and visited his doctor at least once a month for those 15 years. His pattern of sickness has an eerie regularity. 
from February to August 1949, six years after the murders of Ruth First and Muriel Eady, being in regular work and good health, Reg made no visits to Dr. Odess. That September, having been told that his attractive 20-year-old co-tenant, Beryl Evans, was pregnant, his nervous diarrhoea returned. On the 19th of November 1949, ten days after Beryl and Geraldine's murder and the disposal of their bodies, Ridge returned to Dr. Odess complaining of fibrositis in the left lumbar muscles of his back. At his trial, Dr. Odess stated it was caused not by stress, but by physical strain, having lifted something heavy. From January to March 1950, across the trial and the execution of Timothy Evans, having complained of violent headaches and, coincidentally, memory loss, Ridge was signed off work with depression. Two months later, Reg was fit, well, and didn't return to Dr. Odess for almost a year. And then, in the eight months prior to Ethel's death and his last killing spree, he would visit Dr. Odess 32 times. Very little makes sense in the final year of Reg Christie. In April 1950, he asked to be rehoused owing to ill health, even though there were two bodies buried in his back garden. In May 1951, he took out a life insurance policy on himself and his wife, but there would be no payout if she was missing or murdered. And on the 6th of December 1952, days before her death, Reg quit a well-paying job at British Road Services for no reason and with no disability allowance or savings. He stopped his only regular income. Being broke, on the 17th of December, he sold her 22 carat gold ring and gold wristwatch at Barnet Pressman's Jewellers in Shepherd's Bush. On the 8th of January 1953, he sold most of his furniture to Robert J. Hookway for £12. On the 27th of January, he emptied Ethel's bank account of £10, 15 shillings, and sixpence having falsified her signature and being two months behind with his rent. On Friday the 20th of March 1953, having rented out his flat, which he didn't own, to Mary and John O'Reilly at a cost of £7.13, shillings, wearing a brown trilby hat, a fawn raincoat, clutching three suitcases, and with Judy on her lead, Reg left Ten Rillington Place forever. And yet, there was one more death to come at the hands of Reg Christie. That day, having visited Ernest Jacobs at 132 Clarendon Road in Labrador Grove, handed over five shillings, produced his dog license, and shown her badly infected eye to the vet, even though she had been his faithful mongrel for 12 years, Judy was placed in the lethal chamber and put to sleep. By 8pm, having walked five miles from Rillington Place and checked into a six-storey lodging house in King's Cross called Roten House, here he gave his name, address, ID and paid for one week but only stayed for three nights. And as he lay on the itchy woolen sheets, of a single bed in a dormitory full of fifty scratching hobos and snoring tramps. Whereas once he was a war hero, a police constable, and a married man, now Reg Christie was nothing, with no family to turn to, and no friends to trust. Mary and John Riley had a sleepless first night in their ground floor flat at Ten Rillington Place, as the trains thundered by, and the lice scuttled along the walls. But what kept them awake was the smell, and having cleaned thoroughly and opened all of the windows, still a fetid rotten stench lingered in the flat.
four days later, on Tuesday the 24th of March 1953, Beresford Brown, a tenant in the second floor flat, and was due to be moved into the ground floor flat, as Reg had illegally rented it out to the Rileys, he was given permission by the landlord to renovate the kitchen. With his work cut out, as Beresford washed, wiped and stripped the filthy stinking kitchen, eager to nail up a set of brackets for his wireless radio, as he tapped on the rear wall, it gave a reassuringly solid thud. But four feet to the left, the wall sounded hollow. Given the shape of the room, and with its wooden door nailed shut, Beresford thought it was an old coal cellar, so eager for more storage space, as he pulled away a six-inch strip of hastily stuck-up wallpaper off the corner. With a small torch, he peered inside the darkness of the kitchen alcove. Prying open the alcove door, the police were greeted by a macabre sight of a naked woman kneeling, her back to the door, her feet folded under her buttocks, and sitting upright as if she was praying. Her dirt-covered body was kept erect by her bra, which had been secured around a ceiling hook. But as they moved her, they saw that she wasn't alone. In total, the bodies of three unidentified women were found in the alcove. All had been bound, raped and strangled. And with their knickers missing, their pubic hair removed, and overcome by near lethal levels of carbon monoxide, all had been asphyxiated with either a stocking, a tie or a length of rope. Taken to Kensington Mortuary, their identification would pose no problem as having been reported by her landlady, Hannah Rees, the next day at 6.30 p.m., May Langridge of 80 Ladbrook Grove identified the body of her sister, 25-year-old Rita Nelson. At 7 p.m., a local prostitute known as Kitty Foley identified 26-year-old Kathleen Maloney. And having found in the dustbin a sports jacket, cufflinks, and a driving license belonging to Alexander Pomeroy Baker. At 8 p.m., Donald and Robert McClellan identified their sister, 27-year-old Hectorina McClellan. The crime scene was simple, and with the ground floor flat being small and most of the furniture sold, the search was swift and thorough. Noticing another strong, rotten stench emanating from the front room, as he wrenched up a loose floorboard, Chief Inspector Griffin discovered a fourth body. With her wedding ring missing, her bank account empty, and all of the neighbours stating that she was either in Sheffield, Brighton, Northampton or Reading. At 4.30pm that same day, Henry Waddington identified the body under the floorboards as that of his sister, 54-year-old Ethel Christie. And yet, Ten Rillington Place still had more secrets to reveal. Two days later, when police lifted up an old metal dustbin in the rear corner of the garden, the bottom fell away and out fell fragments of burnt and broken bones. Digging two feet deep, they found the skeletal remains of two unidentified females but having been buried almost a decade ago, with no facial features, fingerprints or ID, and with one skull missing and the other smashed into 92 pieces, a positive identification would be next to impossible. Except, with the second skeleton matching a missing persons report dated the 4th of November 1944, and the severed second and third vertebrae matching a skull found in a bombed out house at 133 St. Mark's Road. The body was positively ID'd as 32 year old Muriel Edie. 
and having painstakingly reconstructed the badly smashed skull, and spotted an unusual metal crown in her upper right molar. Having identified this as the work of an Austrian dentist called Dr. Heinrich Blask, a surgery he had performed 23 years earlier, the first skeleton was positively identified as 21-year-old Austrian refugee Ruth First. And yet, Ten Rillington Place still had even more secrets to reveal. As the police searched a rubbish pile in the garden, amongst the burnt papers and charred clothes, they spied a small metal box of Lewis and Burroughs' Gies Linter's pastels. Every lozenge had been eaten, and the box was empty, except for four matted clumps of pubic hair. Having exhumed her corpse in Gunnersbury Cemetery, the pubic hair didn't match Beryl Evans. Having checked her body in Kensington Mortuary, the pubic hair didn't match Ethel Christie. And although three of the matted clumps matched Rita Nelson, Kathleen Maloney and Hectorina McClellan, a fourth clump of pubic hair was never identified. The grisly murders at Ten Rillington Place were front page news. The name on everyone's lips was John Reginald Halliday Christie, and his photo adorned every paper, emblazoned with the words, Will the killer strike again? As Britain was gripped with the terror that a sadistic serial killer was on the run. Only, he wasn't exactly on the run. On Tuesday the 31st of March 1953, at 9.10am, Police Constable Thomas Ledger was patrolling the south bank of the River Thames, just shy of Putney Bridge, when he noticed a dishevelled man in a crumpled fawn raincoat, leaning over the embankment wall as he idly watched a river barge being loaded. Growing suspicious that the unkempt man was a vagrant, PC Ledger questioned him. What are you doing here? Looking for work? Yes, but my employment cards haven't come through. What's your name and address? John Waddington, 35 Westbourne Gardens. Have you anything to prove your identity? No, nothing at all. Not believing the man's story, PC Ledger demanded, Remove your hat. Which the man dutifully did. And being five foot eight inches tall, 54 years old, with a very recognisable bald head, thick lens spectacles, and false teeth which slipped, PC Ledger stated, You're Christie. Reg nodded. PC Ledger said, You better come with me. And that was that. At 10.45am, on the 31st of March 1953, at Putney Police Station, Detective Inspector Kelly charged Reg Christie with murder, and it was then, when prompted by overwhelming evidence, that he gave the bulk of his statements. Of the few items he had on his person was his marriage certificate and a photo of his wife. Having been declared sane and confessed to the murder of Beryl Evans, but not Geraldine Evans, the trial of John Reginald Halliday Christie began on Monday the 22nd of June 1953 in Court 1 of the Old Bailey. Tried on a specimen charge for the murder of Ethel Christie, when asked how he pleaded, Reg replied, Not guilty. And although he remained calm throughout, his memory of the murders was patchy. At the end of the four-day trial, on Thursday the 25th of June 1953, having deliberated for just one hour and twenty minutes, the jury returned and unanimously found John Reginald Halliday Christie guilty. Transferred to Pentonville Prison to await his execution, although his grey prison fatigues were the only uniform in his life that he despised wearing, 
he adored the notoriety of being an infamous serial killer. Confined to the condemned man's cell, Christie whiled away his final days by playing dominoes, reading books, cutting out newspaper articles about himself, and he would happily discuss the details of the trial with his guards. Comparing himself to infamous murderers like John George Haig, and relishing the fact that tabloid newspaper, the Sunday Pictorial, offered him £27,000 for his life story. Although he was described as neat, friendly and quiet, an unassuming little man who spoke fondly of his wife, doctors concluded that he was a conceited egocentric with no remorse for any of his victims. And as witnessed by prison officer Joseph Hornsby, he was a deluded sexual predator. As when officer Hornsby guided the prisoner to the toilet to urinate, Reg Christie turned to the prison guard, held his exposed penis in his hand, and said, The ladies love this. On the morning of Wednesday the 15th of July 1953, in the execution chamber of Pentonville Prison, where three years earlier Timothy John Evans had been hung, at 9am precisely, with his execution having been meticulously planned, so it caused no unnecessary distress. The executioner, Albert Pierpoint, swung open the twin trap doors. The prisoner plunged a seven foot and six inch drop and with the dislocation of his third and fourth vertebrae, Rich Christie was dead. Unlike his victims, he felt no pain. Ironically, he was strangled by a length of rope. And as a man who struggled with impotence, it was his hanging which caused him to ejaculate. With new evidence having come to light, the murders of Beryl and Geraldine Evans were re-evaluated. Timothy John Evans was found not guilty. And with the British establishment rocked by the revelation that an innocent man had been executed, in 1965, the death penalty was abolished. One year later, Timothy John Evans was granted a posthumous royal pardon and his remains were reburied on consecrated ground. The body of John Reginald Halliday Christie remains to this day buried within the walls of Pentonville Prison. And as much as his name is infamous in the annals of true crime, and his ghastly deeds have gone down in infamy. Let us not forget those ten names, who history has cruelly consigned to being just mere footnotes in his dirty little life. They were Ruth First, Muriel Eady, Beryl Evans, Timothy Evans, Geraldine Evans, Ethel Christie, Rita Nelson, Kathleen Maloney, Hectorina McClellan, all of their unborn babies, and his mongrel dog Judy. And this was their story. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. That was the final part of The Other Side of Ten Rillington Place. And because it was quite a complicated story, I'll be rolling out an omnibus edition of the series next week with all of the waffle taken out, as well as a special Q&A episode. So if you have any questions, please do contact me. And if you're a murky miler, stay tuned for some more mindless waffle after the break, as well as some important news about the Murder Mile True Crime podcast. No, not that news. New news. But before that, here's my recommended podcast of the week. The world can be a mysterious place. It can also be a boring place, so let's focus on the mysterious. Rusty Hinges is a podcast that explores mysteries, hoaxes, natural phenomena, and weird history. Basically, anything that's a bit, well, hinky. Season 1 topics include the tale of Clarence Roberts, a man who died more than once. And then there is the maybe kidnapping of June Robles, 
the sun that danced in the sky over Portugal, and an unsolved murder on the high seas. Rusty Hinges is generally skeptical, but never dismissive. Well, <laughs> usually not dismissive. You can find Rusty Hinges on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. That's Rusty Hinges. R-U-S-T. You know what? I have faith in your spelling abilities, so go and subscribe to Rusty Hinges and maybe you'll solve a mystery. Probably not, but you know, you never know. I'm Javier with Pretend Radio, and this season, I'm embedding myself in a cult. Throw him to the ground and get his devils out! Many in the media have tried to get in front of the accused cult leader, Jane Whaley, and have failed. We have asked you to leave. But somehow, I got in. How are you, sir? Yeah, yeah um, I'm here to speak with Jane Whaley. She invited me to service today. Yeah. This season... We're going deeper into the Word of Faith Fellowship than ever before. This story is on a collision course, and it's not going to end well. Why would anybody want to harm him? Sometimes we hurt other people by hurting people they love. Pretend Radio, Season 3, The Prophet. What's the matter with us? We're not going to burn God! A big thank you this week to my new Patreon supporter, Sarah Terrell, and to those brave souls on Patreon who are helping fund the next step of Murder Mile and the new exciting podcasts. Ooh. So thank you to Sarah and all my Patreon supporters. You are the jam in my Battenberg cake. Yummy. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, and with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. Oh, oops, get up, my cup. Get, 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 get. Oh, 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 get up, get up, get up, get up. There you go. Dun, 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 dun. Right. Where's me watch? How long did it? Oh dear, that took ages. Right. Watch. Okay. And da, 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 da. welcome to Extra Mile. Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? You all good? You all diddling well? Good. Oh dear. That was tiring. That was a long record. That was a long episode. That one. That's going to be a bugger to edit. Um, it's Monday now, the Monday just before the episode comes out, so uh, yeah, I've got, I've got three days to edit this. Oh, it's going to be a long one as well, I can feel it in my bones, but there was a lot in that episode, there was a lot, what I did across the series was I gave you a lot of information, kind of bits and pieces, thinking I won't have to do too much in the final episode, uh, but then I realised as I was writing the final episode, there was still a lot to tell you. There was a lot that I took out as well. And there's there's a lot that I have to remind you of from the other episodes. Do you know, because it's been, what, ten weeks now? Two and a half months since we started this big old odyssey. So there's a lot of information, especially in the early episodes, that it's easy to forget. I I've, No, I've forgotten about it already. So Whew, out of breath, out of breath. Got a tea on the go, so I'll have to disappear in a second. Uh, where am I at the moment? I'm, uh, I'm middle of nowhere at the moment. Not really middle of nowhere. I'm far in West London, but I mean, I'm on a part of the canal that people ignore because they think there's nothing here. Uh, it just looks like there's a, a, a grass bank, but actually behind the grass bank is like a big Tesco's and a big B&Q and a big B&M stores. And there's a, there's a Costa coffee and you know, there's everything you need there. It's all five minutes away. So it's actually a good, good place to hang out. It's a good place to hide. So I'm here. Um, it's cold at the moment. It's, uh, the weather is, uh, it's gone past, uh, freezing. So the canal is slightly frozen up, but looking at now, it looks like all the uh, ice is gone. Uh, it's it's bloody cold, so I've had the fire on. No Coot news. Uh, Coot was outside partway through, having a little bit of a dip, 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 as he does, but uh, he buggered off, which was good. 
Uh, and the, we had the Blood Moon last night, so I know a lot a lot of people may have stayed awake to watch Blood Moon, which is I think it's when there's a transition of the sun and the moon and Earth and blah blah blah, and the moon goes blood red. I couldn't be asked to stay up to watch it. <laughs> I couldn't be asked to wait, stay awake to watch a moon that's normally white go red. I just not that bothered really. <laughs> couldn't be asked uh so it's nice and peaceful here and uh, all very good i'll try not to get onto the next part of what i need to say because i'm waiting for my tea to die because i don't i don't want to do, 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 do. don't want to disrupt it uh so all is good here all is well hope you well. hope you enjoyed the, the series so far it's been it's uh, i've enjoyed writing this one i enjoyed writing part 10 as well it's been really good uh, I've had had a bit of a giggle with it. I had to rein myself back in a bit, but um, hopefully that's good. Uh, you will have noticed. Hopefully, if I, I haven't checked the footage yet or the the audio yet, but uh, if if I manage to make it work, uh, the man who arrested John Reginald Christie was known as PC Thomas Ledger, uh, a V Division, V Division PC Number Four Hundred down in Putney. Um, that was played by Police Constable Arsenal Guinness. Yes, the very same Police Constable Arsenal Guinness. If I manage to get the audio to work, because uh, I was using a new recorder. So we'll see. If not, I've added it myself. Or I've played it myself. But we'll see. We'll see at the end. Obviously, I can't tell you now because I haven't edited it yet. Uh, but that was all good. Nice to meet up with Police Constable Arsenal Guinness. Last Monday, I believe it was. Yeah, last Monday we met up. We did a bit of recording. Because he's a copper, he was constantly looking out for crimes to solve, which is what he does. And then, and then we uh, we had a couple of cheeky beers, which is very nice. Tea's brewing. Hey. Hot, 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 hot. Oh, spillage. Nice bit of uh, PG tips. Two sugar. I can't remember whether I put sugar in, so it's either going to be really, really sugary and sweet or not. Uh, and yes, even though it's winter, I've got powdered milk. I just can't be bothered with buying fresh milk. Uh, there we go, powdered milk. I don't mind it now. It's all right. It does the bits, doesn't it? I've got some bickies. I haven't got a cake today. I had a cake, but then I ate it last night because I was, I was up until late trying to write this. I was trying to finish on Sunday night. I was trying to finish this mammoth of a script it's a biggie normally they only go to five or six pages this is about eight and a half it's about, about nearer to ten before i edit it down right got my tea got my bickies these are uh mcvitties digestives the milk chocolate ones not the dark ones because i'm not a heathen uh good okay let's crack on with with the stuff that we do normally i'd crack into uh some uh info on christy that we'd normally do uh i'll do something else instead so <laughs> tea slurp murder mile update so this is obviously the last episode of uh the last part of the other side of ten million to place as mentioned we will do the omnibus edition next week it might be have to be in two parts or possibly three because it's a ten parter and I can't I can't seem to upload more than two hours per episode uh, through my podcast host I don't know why so there we go uh, so it may be in two parts and then we'll do a Q&A episode as promised so if you've got any questions please do some people have already I can't promise to read them all out but I'll certainly try my best um now, as you know, as mentioned in uh, part eight, and I've mentioned it on social media as well, uh, this is the uh, last episode of the Murder Mile True Crime podcast. Uh, if uh, you're shocked by this um, and you don't listen to Extra Mile, it was all in the Extra Mile for uh, part eight, and I mentioned it at the end of part nine, and, and, and I'm mentioning it again now. And it's on social media as well, so um, I'm, I'm sorry if you missed that, but Murder Mile True Crime podcast... Uh, will be coming to an end i know i was meant to do uh, another couple of seasons but i just exhausted absolutely exhausted it's killing me um but a uh, big thank you to everyone who sent through really lovely comments I, I hope i've got through to everyone so far i've tried to reply to everyone but uh obviously <laughs> i wasn't expecting so much kind of 
love from so many people that you know it, it was a lot there was a lot going on a lot of pe- people really and, and not just oh we're gonna miss you really like people had really taken their time to really mu- lo- write me really lovely messages so I've, I've i've tried really hard to reply to everyone but if i if all i've done is ticked like uh i have read it it's just i i, I, I you know it, it all came in all, all at once and i'm still to this day like a week on week on probably longer like 10 days on still replying to emails uh which i i, I plan to keep doing so thank you to everyone um but the love you show me has just been absolutely fabulous and really great uh and it's you know uh it's given me a chance to have a, a little think about uh what i want to do um and although i i I can't continue with Murder Mile, and you know my reasons why I've kind of said that last time. I, you know, I do, I do still love Murder Mile, and clearly you guys still love it as well. So I'm thinking about doing this. This is something I think about doing. I can't come back and redo Murder Mile as a weekly thing. That's just not possible at all. And what I do need to do is take a break and go off and write these other podcasts and get the I want to really want to get the new podcast off the ground and then get the the second one off the ground and do things like that and re- keep myself busy. But there's still loads of stories I I want to tell with Murder Mile, do you know. Uh, so what I'm thinking I may do is return with Murder Mile with uh, specials. So um, things like the Blackout Ripper things like 10 Rillington Place so every so often instead of doing like a weekly or a monthly every so often what I'll do is just uh I'm not going to hold hold myself to dates at the moment because I think that that was what's freaking me out with with Murder Mile at the moment is just you know being forced into this having to do one every single week and being stuck with it so uh what I'm thinking about doing is returning with specials so every so often every three or four months or whatever uh i just go right here we go like you get you'll get a promo saying this is coming next week and then like uh, for three or four weeks you'll get a a multi-part series um so that's what i'm thinking about doing at the moment so it may not be a farewell a farewell murder mile it may just be a, a bit of a long hiatus maybe that's what i need is a bit of a hiatus and you know what maybe if 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 that goes well maybe i i return doing and doing monthly podcasts with murder mile so i have all my other podcasts but then once a month i do a big case i don't know maybe that's what i do because murder mile is labor intensive but if i did over a month or I did a multi-parter over three months. Do you know, yeah, that's probably easier to do. And it means I don't have to say goodbye to Murder Mile, which I still do enjoy and love. So, so um, don't hold me to that. But that's kind of my thinking at the moment. And I think, do you know what? Having had some time off, I'll probably feel a lot better about about Murder Mile. At the moment, it's, it's, it's nice to write this episode. I really enjoyed writing this episode. The last one was a bugger. I really hated it. Uh just it felt like a drag but this one felt it felt like a a last hurrah and i really enjoyed writing this one uh you know the the love for murder mile uh, is still there so um here's my bit of advice for you i i'm gonna obviously uh next week i'm gonna go away uh getting my boat repaired i've got a week of boat repair so i'm gonna go radio silence because i literally have got to focus on repairing the boat uh but you've got more than 60 murder mile episodes out there uh which are still up they're all going to stay up the the episodes aren't going to go anywhere although i need to contact my uh podcast host today because all of my stats seem to have disappeared although all the episodes are still there i'm just hoping they haven't deleted my whole account or something something i hope i think it's just their stat system has gone down um so uh, because i've got like 60 plus episodes if you want to um Listen to the back catalogue of Murder Mile. If you listen to one a day, uh, by the time you finish that, uh, doing all 65 episodes, I think it's 65 roughly or something like that, by the time you've done one of those a day, I should have the new series up and running, uh, which I still can't tell you much about because it's still a bit a bit hush-hush. Uh, so that should be up and running. Uh, and then, uh, you know, by then I'll... I'll probably be feeling a lot better and i can probably start writing a mur- some murder mile specials in my spare time so i'll keep all of the murder mile accounts up uh and uh yeah yeah so nothing definite yet don't hold me to any dates because I-, I think with murder mile i'm, I'm going to keep it a bit free form because it's such a complicated thing i think i think what i should really do is just focus on getting it right as opposed to rushing it to get it out by a set date so uh you know 
if, if, if you listen to things like uh, fantastic series out there, like Secret History of Hollywood by Adam Roche, he does like one episode once every six months. But and, and there's no real date or rhyme or reason when he releases them. But when he does release them, it's like Christmas. It really is. They're so beautifully done. I've just listened. I'm listening to his uh, uh, multi-part series on Val Luton. And I think we started listening to it about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. I'm still listening to it now and it's still fabulous. So, uh, you know, I, I like the way that he does that, that he, he kind of, you know, he releases it when it's when it's ready as opposed to, you know, going, oh, I've got to get it done by next week, which can be a bit of a bun. It, it's fine if you sit there and just waffle about something you read on Wikipedia. But when it's when you want to get like me, if you want to get the research right and you want to get you know the sounds perfect, you know there's nothing worse than rushing it. So um, to that, I know all change, all change. You you know me, I never stick to my plans fully. So uh, all change on the murder mile, but not all change, all change ish. So uh, um, also uh, this was this was an idea from uh, Police Constable Arsenal Guinness when I think we're on our, about our six pint pint probably um have think about having a well and not quite we were thinking then about having a farewell party for murder Mile, but really it's not a farewell party anymore but i still like the idea of doing that so um sometime in april uh i'm probably thinking saturday the 6th of april uh of this year uh 2019 obviously if you're listening in 2020 this happened ages ago um think about how somewhere in london a pub in central london that evening um a chance i'll put it on social media i'll try and put it on the promo for the new podcast hopefully that'll be up and running by then so i can kind of say to people if you're in london come along come and meet me i'll invite along some other podcasters as well uh, and it'll just be a nice evening have some drinks have a chat uh, get some murder mile badges and goodies I've got bloody loads of them uh, <laughs> so that'll be exciting so uh, no more information on that now because it's only just mulling in my head but that's exciting um, at present I still have some mugs available there's only about 8 left now uh, so uh, if you want them go to my website or if you're going to book on my tour you can book a mug uh and a ticket as well for the tour you, you can do that uh, i only have eight left um just to say to anyone who has bought m- mugs uh i apologize i've just noticed recently i lifted up one of the mugs and i was like w- what is going on there seems to be something weird something sticky on the bottom and i realized even though i'd stored them in a very dry and very cold place because all the mugs have sweets in them the bloody fox's glacier mints they, all of them had melted into like mush and they'd all leaked through and I didn't realise so I sent out loads of mugs and because they weren't leaking I didn't realise that they'd leaked inside so I've cleaned them all now all of the new mugs have been cleaned I've got rid of all the all the mucky 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 sweets uh, but if anyone has bought mugs and they are full of uh, mucky mucky muck let me know and I, I'll replace your goodies the, the mugs I think I've, I've wiped them all down they're easy to clean but if your stickers are ruined or your tea bags or uh, message me and I'll send you some new stuff. So sorry about that. I've only just realised. That was a lot of breath. Right. Let's get down to some Christy stuff. Oh, I hope, I hope if anyone's on my <laughs> Murder Mile True Crime Podcast discussion group on Facebook, I hope you like the picture I posted the other day. <laughs> that kept me very amused. I posted a picture of <laughs> a... Uh, um, a uh, nice villa in the 1950s, 1960s in Barbados. And I linked a picture saying, this, <laughs> this was Reg Christie's holiday home in Barbados when he was released from prison <laughs> and uh, they they publicly apologised for <laughs> innocently, for, for convicting him of crimes he was innocent of. Uh, that was just a bit of fun. I thought I'd throw that up just to tease people. Some people got it. I don't think everyone got it. But I do enjoy I do enjoy having fun. So, Reg Christie stuff that I didn't put in. There's some stuff here that I've tried to put in so often that I just haven't been able to find space for it. So, um, 
1951, so before Ethel Christie died, but after Timothy uh, Evans and Beryl Evans and Geraldine Evans died, in the first floor flat was a lady who was known as Pat. Her real name was Joan May Howard. Uh, she was 25. She lived in the first floor. She was quite pally with uh, Ethel Christie. Um, now, Ethel Christie, when they when they would like put out the uh, laundry or stuff in the back garden, you know, to dry it off, uh, Ethel Christie would mention to her about about the Evanses and about everything that went on there and stuff like that, and the fact that the wife and her baby were murdered, and you know, it's a bit gris- grisly. Pat found it quite grisly. Um, Ethel showed Joan, uh, Joan, her, her nickname's Pat, Pat. Uh, photos of Beryl and Geraldine that Reg Christie had taken. Uh, and every time she would do this, uh, Ethel Christie would get a little bit upset about it. Um, a few days after that, Pat was having tea with Ethel uh, and was being shown cuttings related to the case because obviously Christie kept all of the cuttings. As, as I mentioned, Joe, he was very... He loved his, himself, he loved his name, things like that. Um... And Ethel had stated to Pat that their relationship had gone really bad since the case. And she even said to Pat, uh, Ethel felt sure that her husband had done it. Now, whether that's true, because this was said post uh, Christie's conviction, but that's what Pat said, who was the neighbour there. As we know, Christie was a keen photographer. I tried to get this into the the final three episodes, the kind of kind of all the stories about, which is why I mixed up the order at the end, because I wanted to show that Christie was manipulating people through his photography, as he had as he had done with Beryl, as he did with Kathleen Maloney when he took them, the um, those ladies to the photographic studio and simulated sex with them. I wanted to show that this was a theme, but I couldn't get it into the series, which is why I mixed the order around to get Kathleen Maloney first. Uh, but I ended up not putting it in. But uh, Christie was a keen photographer, as we know. One day, when his wife was present, Christie asked to take photos of Pat uh, who uh, with her cat and dog, which he did. Uh, he then asked to take some nude photos of her, which she declined. Uh, Ethel was present in the room at this time. Um, now, this caused a bit of a rift between Pat and Reg Christie. A few days later, when Pat uh, was with her boyfriend in the flat, this is the first floor flat, he was an RAF corporal called John Walter. Um, Christie accused her of being a prostitute. This is something he did a lot to women who who spurned his advances. Uh, and he screamed, the only place for women like you is dead. If I had my way, I would do it. And apparently this was said in Ethel's presence as well. Um, he later threatened her again when she returned, saying, remember what I said, I'll do you in. Obviously, this was said post Christie's conviction. So a lot of these, how much can you really believe? It, it, it is really hard to tell. Uh, did she go to the police prior to that and say, I've been threatened? No. So uh, as we know, he was a uh, war reservist policeman, a special constable in London. He started that on uh, 1st of September 1939, which was the uh, start of World War Two, And he ended his service 28th of December 1943. So that was after he had murdered Ruth First and Muriel Eady. Um, obviously, he'd spent a lot of time during World War One. He'd seen a lot of bodies on the front, front line, the 11 weeks he was on there. Uh, he had a fascination with death. He would often say that it was quite fascinating, Joe, pulling bodies and body parts out of buildings there was a lot of death going on but also around the time of, uh that uh, world war Two, the because there wasn't a lot of policemen hence police war reservists there was a lot of crime going on a lot of looting a lot of bribery um so this was a really good opportunity for him to kind of engage into his crim- criminality that he had before but also it is said although whether there's truth of this although i think we know christy enough to believe this an opportunity to hit for him to grope and fondle dead bodies. Um, this also gave him regular access to uh, prostitutes. Now, even though as a police war, war rever- re- re- reservist, his job really was to track down petty thieves and deserters. Uh, obviously, he had reg- regular access to local prostitutes. Um, and although, you know, they always said he was commended twice for, you know, and he, he was a very good and useful officer. 
Uh, it was here that he learned to do his first aid, uh, which became very useful for him. Uh, but he would, it is said he would pick up prostitutes on his duties. Uh, now, one other officer, I haven't got his name here, complained to the sergeant, uh, saying that Christie was always turning a blind eye to prostitution. Uh, now, this is almost possibly entirely true, as it is said that he had several relationships with local prostitutes uh, whilst he was married to Ethel so during this period. So he actually used and abused his, as we've seen already, his position as a uniformed man, as rank and all, all stuff like that in order to get what he wanted. In fact, um, he would use his authority as a policeman to get whatever he wanted. He loved to lord it up with, in front of people with his uniform, even though he wasn't a proper policeman. He was, you know, a, a reservist. Um, it is said there wasn't a single person on Rillington Place who he didn't threaten to turn them in for, you know, petty offences. You know, uh, obviously, if you are getting there was a lot of black market stuff. Uh, out and about then like normal people would you know because there's rationing going on normal people would you know if a mate goes oh do you know we, we can get you some tea bags or do you know uh, we can get you some good meat that's ra that's uh, outside your rations do you know that's black market so that's illegal but you know the average person would do it because you know they need to survive uh but reg, reg christie would dob them in he was he was that kind of arsehole right um, going towards the trial case, okay, so obviously near the end of this, I couldn't get in all the details about Reg Christie's trial. I mean, that could be an episode in its own right, but I, I, I did get to the point of thinking this should be another extra part of it, but I thought, let's just end it now. I don't want to drag, drag this out any further with extraneous details. So, as I mentioned before, uh, Reg Christie's his whisper is you know they couldn't work there was no medical reason why he still had a, a whisper because he only had functional aphonia uh, and they said it was catarrhal laryngitis he suffered with which they they solved with a, a mist expectorant so basically a menthol mist on his throat for 32 uh, for three weeks and that would have solved it but for some reason he, he still had his little whisper for the rest of his life which a lot of doctors said was put on there was an incident just before his father um, uh, disowned him where he shouted at his father and his voice was loud. It was loud and, you know, booming. Um, but on the at the end of the third day of the trial, Christie's trial, just after lunch, I like the way it's written here. It says just after luncheon, luncheon, um, Mr. Heaney, who was the capital officer, uh, was guiding Christie back downstairs from uh, courtroom one back down to the cells which were immediately underneath courtroom one it kind of made it easier to get the uh, the accused in and out he grabbed uh he grabbed a uh, christy by the back of the arm to guide him downstairs which was his job and christy turned round to him and barked in a very loud and what they described as a vicious voice not a whisper that he used throughout the court case he, he shouted take your bloody hands off me in a really loud and booming voice so it, it very much was put on. He could not have his little whisper voice if he wanted it. Uh, as I mentioned on here as well, uh, Christie was charged uh, for the murder of Ethel Christie. And this was a specimen charge. Uh, I've used the phrase specimen charge before, but in case you missed it, I'll, I'll reference it again. Um, if someone is charged with multiple offences... Uh, the prosecution and the defence can, can make a decision about what the best way is to go. Uh, either you can charge Reg Christie with all of the offences, uh, all of the murders, which means you, has, you have to charge him nine times, which can be a real pain in the arse. Because, you know, if, if he's found guilty of the murder of Hectorina McClellan, but he isn't found guilty of the murder of Rita Nelson, because, you know, there could be an imbalance in the kind of the... Uh, Oh, someone's got their engine on because uh, of the imbalance in kind of the the evidence that's available um because that can be a little bit dubious and a bit all over the shop sometimes it's easier just to have a specimen charge which says i'm going to charge you for the murder of in this case ethel christie and if you are found guilty of the murder of ethel christie therefore by default it is said that you've committed all these other murders as well uh, now, quite often, for the, both the defence and the prosecution, this is kind of the best outcome. 
because it saves a lot of time, it saves a lot of money, it saves a lot of manpower, but also it's kind of like, um, you know, if for the def uh, for the defence, if he's found guilty of the murder of Ethel Christie, that's fine. You know, he's found guilty. If he's found innocent, he's found innocent of all the other crimes as well. They can't charge him for all the other murders, so it actually makes sense to have a specimen charge. The, the court kind of appreciates it as well. It makes more sense. So that's why he was charged with the murder of Ethel Christie. Um, uh, when he was on remand, so when he was arrested, before he was sent to Pentonville Prison, uh, after he was found guilty, he was at Brixton Prison. Brixton Prison, which is where the Blackout Ripper was held. Uh, and the principal officer, uh, J.C.M. Matheson, who we've mentioned before with the Blackout Ripper, he interviewed Reg Christie uh, at least three times at length, and he was the man who deemed him sane uh, and able to stand trial. He said there didn't seem to be any hint of uh, insanity at all. He clearly, which is not to say he's a, not a nut job, but it's just to say he knew what he was doing. It's very clear. That's the difference between sane and insane. Do you know what you're doing is right and wrong? And Christie clearly knew that it was wrong, uh, but he still did it. Um, so he was deemed fit to stand trial. Uh, and even though he was also examined by Dr. Jack Hobson and Dr. Desmond Curran, uh, both of them uh, declared that he was a severe hysteric, a gross hysteric, and that he had a large capacity for disassociation. Which is interesting, when you look at Christie's statements, there's very much disassociation going on. He distances himself from from the fact that these people that they're real victims real people uh, he, he and that he believes that they sexually wanted him that was his big thing that it was all about you know uh his whole life was really just about sexual desire and it's being seen as kind of a a great sexual power and etc i love using the word etc it just <laughs> might as well just say full stop uh okay so uh during his uh psychological evaluation as well uh, Christie uh, was given the Rorschach test. Uh, if you know about that, that's the uh, ink blots. So they're not just random ink blots. They're basically very carefully defined ink blots. They're mirrored. It's it's a mirrored ink blot. It looks random, but obviously when you look at it, uh, the psychiatrist says, uh, "What is it that you see?" And you know, most of them look like butterflies or things like that. But it really is when you look at it. It it. it what you see is is a reflection of your internal workings uh so this was done on christie no information was given to the doctor in advance about them who the man was at all he just sat him down and said okay what uh what do you see in these ink blots uh and when the results came back the doctor said that christie was a sad unhappy and rather inadequate anxiety ridden little man with sufficient with a sufficiently well-structured personality to have survived life in a circumscribed narrow level, and that he probably suffers from psychosomatic complaints, a good deal of aggressiveness and regression. Which is uh, pretty accurate, actually. Very accurate. Uh, so that was that. Um, on Christie, when he was... Uh, so uh, this is all the personal stuff he had in his cell before... Uh, after he died, obviously, his cell was cleared. Uh, most of his stuff was destroyed because he didn't have any next of kin, really. And kind of no one really wanted it. They didn't want it to become mawkish souvenir, so most of his stuff was, was destroyed. A few bits were held by the police, but that was it. So of his personal possessions, he had 17 letters... Uh, one telegram. I've no idea what they what they are. I haven't got it written here at the moment. Two birthday cards. Because uh, it had in the April. Yeah, just passed in the April. That was his birthday. So he only received two birthday cards. I believe one of them was from uh, 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 the uh, publican of the Cider House in Harrow Road. I believe. Um, two religious tracts. Because don't forget he was a Methodist. Four newspapers because he loved reading about himself two pairs of spectacles interestingly when they checked his vision he had what they was described as as uh six six uh six out of six which means he, he had pretty good vision but uh he chose to wear really thick glasses interesting uh spectacles case uh he had one uh tobacco tin Although he claimed that he didn't smoke, he did smoke. He had a tendency to smoke Mankin cigars as well, which are kind of quite a cheap brand. 
uh, one photograph of himself in the army which he kept on his wall which was interesting that was one of the few photographs he had which was him in his early days so obviously that's the moment in his life where he felt the best and the most proud and things like that uh, to his name is he had one shilling and ten pence which uh, which ain't a lot what would that be today that's probably not that's probably barely even a pound probably barely even a pound I think 30 shillings was the equivalent oh I can't I can't think about it at the moment uh, as well as his clothing uh, as mentioned before he also had his marriage certificate with him and a photo of his wife when he was given an autopsy uh, obviously they have to give him an autopsy even though they know how he died uh, he died by um, hanging uh, everyone who was executed has to be given an autopsy to prove uh, that the that the death was correct uh, and when they checked him he had two operational scars uh, a small scar on the inner side of his left knee and a scar on the top of his right shoulder so those would be the scars from when he was knocked off his bike in the West End in 1923 uh it was proved that he had seminal emission as they called it so he did uh ejaculate that does happen when you're um asphyxiated by a rope even if it's a fast death like that you, you know you do um ejaculate uh effusion of the eyes so his, his eyes were all um uh bloodshot his last meal uh basically contained alcohol so it was believed he had a whiskey although they they didn't mention that um quite why this is on the autopsy but it said he had a well developed well developed penis and he was uncircumcised uh, which is always useful to know i get i guess they put it in there because you know was uh, whether the belief is that uh he was uh, a rapist and all that because he had a tiny penis or something like that but um obviously not uh he had no hint of venereal disease which was interesting given the amount of prostitutes he slept with uh, and death was in instantaneous and when they checked his EKG which was prior to his execution they said that he had a uh, an abnormal rhythm in his heart which was interesting we've found that a couple of times with a couple of the people that we've mentioned in these murder cases when their heart rhythm has been checked they have an abnormal rhythm so um, whether that is important I don't know uh, <gasps> deep breath right getting to the end um According to um, my neighbours moving away, I got no no neighbour. Oh, boo hoo! Um, according to um, the psychological report by J C M Matheson, who is the principal officer at uh, Brixton Prison, principal uh, medical officer at Brixton Prison, uh, Christie had to render his victims unconscious before he could have sexual intercourse with them. Otherwise, there was a risk that he would wit uh, that, that they would witness his impotence and his sexual inadequacy, which that I think really sums up the whole case. That's it in a nutshell, right there. Literally, is when you go back to the start, it's des the desperation to be as good or better than his father, who was desperate to be. Uh, uh, seen as middle class and in a good profession so that was going on there the repression uh living in a repressed victorian era with his family where sex wasn't discussed that kind of thing and then the the monkey run incident whether that's in true we actually don't know that would that was christie's words but it could be true uh it sounds logical uh that you know he couldn't get an erection when he was trying to have uh lose his virginity to a girl and they all call him christy no cock and uh, reggie can't get it up uh and that is the start of his uh sexual inadequacy so um that was interesting i think i think that uh yeah no i think that sums up christy so core cool, dear that was uh that was a lot of work so i hope you enjoyed that that was the other side of Ten Rillington Place. Ooh, a ten-parter. That was good, wasn't it? That was good. So, um, as mentioned, next week, I'm going to do a Omnibus edition. There'll be a QA. and a so message me. You, you can contact me on social media or email or, you know, there's about a billion ways to contact me. Message me. Uh, hopefully soon I'll know more about the uh, kind of not-quite-farewell party. But, you know, it'll be like a podcaster's get-together or something like that. That'll be good fun. Um, and then 
hopefully we'll know more about the new podcasts and you know maybe some murder mile specials as well so uh that'd be interesting there's a lot a lot of a lot of big stories i was planning for season three and four uh which i would yeah i wouldn't mind trying to trying to get to so okay that was extra mile that was murder mile uh i will see you next week for what, what i think i might title as the almost but not quite farewell <laughs> murder mile episode so uh thank you to you all uh have a good week and i will see or hear or or not from you all soon wishing you well Bye-bye.